stuff. Um, today's subject is a little bit about screens, but it applies to more than just media. Today we're talking about words. Everybody say words. Words are, of course, a part of screens and social media and all that type of stuff. Um, there's two primary ways that we interact with words. Who wants to take a guess at what those two ways are? You are here in middle school. Cheater. Nobody wants to. So, let's... Is it written and spoken? Yeah. Is it written and yeah. spoken? There you go, Slingy. Good job. Yes, written word and spoken word. What is an example of written word? Everybody's like, the Bible, looking at the screen, text messages, books, Instagram captions, all of those things are examples of what type of word? Written. This is not true. The middle schoolers were significantly smarter than you all. Yes, it is written word. Now, what is the other way that you think you interact with words? Written, and then we said? Like this. Like, like this. Yes, this is called what type of word? He said it. Spoken. Spoken. So spoken word is something that you hear. It's something that you do. All that type of stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. So written and spoken word are part of like social media, media. If you're watching a YouTube video, you are interacting most likely with spoken word because it probably has audio. If you're someone who leaves the captions on all the time when you watch Netflix, you're interacting with written word. All that type of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, what? Can you not leave captions on because you can't read fast? You can't hear without the words on. No, I know somebody. Sure. I get what you mean. I, know, I always leave captions on. Um, but that's because I'm old and I have jacked up hearing, so it's hard for me to hear sometimes. So um, here is kind of another facet to words, specifically with spoken word. There's something that's really important with our words that we use, words that we hear, all that type of stuff. That is something called tone. Everybody say tone. Tone. Can someone give me an example of what tone means when you're talking about spoken words? What, do, what is tone? The way you say something. That's correct. So if I am walking around and I say, hey, Jonisha, what are you doing? Is there anything in my tone that indicates that that's a bad thing? No. No. If I walk out into the atrium and Jonisha has grabbed one of the poor middle schoolers and is dangling them over the balcony, and I yell, Jonisha, what are you doing? That's a totally different way to interact with those words, right? Whenever you're texting with someone, the only real way you can see tone is like maybe if they put an emoji after something or if it's like in all caps because um, they're emphasizing stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. So um, I want to introduce you guys to someone very important to me. This is Bailey. Everybody go, aw. That is my lovely dog. I've had her for over 10 years now. And um, here is the thing about dogs. Dogs don't care what words you use at all. They only care about your tone. Um, so like you can say the nicest, nicest, sweetest thing to a dog in a mean tone and they will run away from you. You can say the meanest thing in a nice tone and they'll be really, really happy. So I decided to torture my dog this week and show you guys what I was talking about. So just give me an example. Here you go. So I start telling her that she's ugly, that I don't love her, but I'm saying in a nice tone, and look at that pretty face. She was so happy. Was I saying nice things to her? No, I was saying she was ugly and that I didn't love her. So I then, right after this, I took a video of me doing the opposite, and so here's a video of her reacting to that. She was not a fan of the tone. And, like, for the record, I'm not crazy. I recorded those in reverse order. So I yelled at her, and then I gave her all sorts of love and affection. Um, so dogs don't really get the words that we use, right? They don't mean anything to them, but our tone matters. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now bear with me. Help, 
make sure you guys connect these dots. Why do we talk to our friends like they're dogs? People understand words, but for so many of us, and I've seen this happen um, at CIY, I've seen this happen out in the atrium, I've had you guys come to me and say this, we will talk to our friends and say the most out-of-pocket, rude, mean stuff about them or to them, but be like, no, 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 like I was sarcastic, so it didn't hurt. Or we're friends, so they get it, it's fine. But that's just not true. People are not dogs. We understand the words that we're using. And here's the thing about our brains. They know that in every piece of sarcasm, there's a little bit of truth. And psychologists have studied our brains and the words that we use. And there's been multiple different experiments. One was done by the National Institute of Health. And they had these doctors go into patients' rooms who had identical injuries, like they all broke their leg or they were all recovering from an ACL tear or whatever it was. And they would say, hey, in this room, I just want you to use positive language the whole time you're in there. Compliment this person, talk about their healing in a good way, all that type of stuff. And then I want you to go into the next room and just be a jerk, right? Just use as much negative language as you can, even though they've had the same surgery, the same injury. It's one of the only studies like this in medicine, at least from what I read and could find, that 100% of the time, every single person that was spoken to in a positive way recovered faster than the person who was not. 100% of this study. The words that we use in our interactions matter. There was another one that was done by a company called Psych Central, and they took a bunch of like little kids and they had them in these brain scans and all this type of stuff. And like when a kid would fall and they would like hurt their knee or something like that, they'd say, as a parent, go up to them and go, no, 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 you're okay. You're fine, that didn't hurt. And what they found is that the brain would take the pain that it was getting from the nerves. And by the time it got to the brain, the brain would shut it off and would pretend that it was okay because it was told through someone's words that you're okay. And they found that the opposite was true. And they, you've probably seen videos of this before. I know I have, I just couldn't find one this week where like a little kid is sitting on a counter or, or is just sitting on the floor. Don't sit your kids on the counter. And, and like the parent will smack a book or something like that behind the kid and then grab their head and go, oh no, I'm so sorry, are you okay? And then the kid will start to cry. And they put these like things on their heads and when they scanned their brains, the brain actually registered that it was receiving pain even though nothing had happened because the words that we use matter. Uh, other studies ha have been on the brain and they study this part called the amygdala. Everybody say amygdala. amygdala. This is a part in your brain that primarily controls fear and controls pain. And something that is universally true is people who've gone through emotional abuse, which is mainly done through words, and people who've experienced verbal abuse, their amygdala literally misshapes. It becomes overactive, it outgrows what it's supposed to be, and these people's brain is in a constant fight or flight response, all because of someone's words. The words that we use matter. The tone that we say them in, sure, that matters. But our tone never excuses the words that we actually use. And so what I mean by that is when we say that sarcastic comment to our friend, sure, they might say, yeah, okay, in the moment. But their brain doesn't process it that way. And the way that they look at themselves in the mirror whenever they're alone changes. And each and every one of you has probably felt this at some point. If you've ever gone to a middle school event, a retreat or a camp as a leader with me, and all the leaders in here who went to CIY can say like, on day three of our team rally, I always tell them this is the worst day of camp. Because everyone has been sarcastic and a jerk with their friends for three or four days, and they're done. They don't wanna be talked to like they're a dog anymore. They wanna be talked to like they're a person. And it always happens, the third full day of camp, you guys lose it with each other because the words that we use matter. And so today I'm not gonna try to disguise the bottom line. I'm gonna give it to you before we ever jump into scripture. You've already heard it from scientists and psychologists, but your words, whether online or in person, 
have incredible strength. The Bible backs this up. Every piece of science backs this up. You know this from the interactions that you have with your friends and with the people who you wouldn't call your friends. Words matter. Words have strength. And scripture, like I said, it backs all this up. It's like God, when he designed your brain, knew how it worked. Over in the book of James, everybody say James. Chapter three, verses five through six, he says this. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes up great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it, it itself sets on fire, is set on fire by hell. Not exactly a nice verse, right? James is basically saying your tongue, everybody stick out your tongue. It's not exactly a big part of your body, but it's one of the most powerful parts of your body. Just like a spark is a small part of a fire, but that's what starts the fire. And the reality in this letter that James is writing is whoever he's writing this to, they have a problem with the words they use. He talks about it in chapter one, two, and three. He brings it up multiple times that the words that they're using, like he says in this verse, are coming straight from hell. We don't know what was happening, but we know that it wasn't good. And I honestly think he would write the same exact thing about this youth group. And I think he would write the same exact thing about some of your small groups. You know what gets said in the group chat that you left that kid out of. You know what gets said at different schools. You know what gets said in your hallways. And the reality is, is it's not the cat that's got our tongue. It's probably Satan. Because the words that we're using don't speak life, they don't build people up, and ultimately, we're hurting each other. And the reality is, is we can choose to say, the words that I use don't matter, and I'm just going to do whatever I want to do because I want to do it, or we can choose to live a different way. Now, my hope is that you would choose the other way, so that's the way I wrote this sermon. So if you want to check out and say, I don't care about the words that I use, then go ahead, you're welcome to. You can leave if you'd like. But if you want to change, and if you want to talk about what Scripture says about your words, we're going to look at kind of four different parts or wisdom that Scripture gives us for the way that we should interact with each other and the way that we should use our words. So the first thing, we're going to call it the 2-1 rule. Everybody say 2-1. Listen more than you speak. The 2-1 rule is really simple. When God designed you, he gave you two ears and one mouth. Use them that way. Right? When God designed you, he did not give you two mouths. Praise the Lord, right? Most of us do not need that. He gave us two ears and one mouth. Again, in the book of James, in chapter one, he says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to what? Slow to, and slow to become angry. Now, whether you're in person or you're interacting with somebody through a screen, social media, texting, whatever the thing may be, um, this matters and this is true. You have probably been in a situation where you got some news, you heard somebody said something, somebody did something, whatever it may be, and you fired off a text and then realized right after you clicked send, I probably should not have said that. Or maybe you didn't, and then they took a screenshot of what you said and sent it to somebody else. And then you realized, I probably shouldn't have said that. Now, here is just a side note as we go through all of this. Every July, right after um, high school camp, is when the youth team and I get together and write out the sermons for the next year. So if any of you are feeling called out right now or feel like this is really relevant, we wrote this sermon a year ago. So it's not like I heard something or your small group leader said something and we decided, oh, we need this message. No, the reality is, is God knows his people and he knew what you needed a year ago. So this 2-1 rule, interacting with words and thinking before you say them, you've probably been in an interaction with your parents or with a teacher or with a friend, and you had this, mm, I'm going to say this, I'm going to get on top, I'm going to sass back, I'm going to do whatever, and then you said something and instantly wished you could take it back, whether it was through social media or a phone or the words coming out of your mouth. The reality is, is James was right. 
We should use that 2-1 rule. We should listen and then be slow to speak and never speak out of anger because it's not something you can ever take back. There's a lot of different examples of this when I was looking online. Um, how many of you are freshmen at ECS? Just a couple of you over there. So I use this example. I spoke at a chapel last year and used the example of toothpaste. Like once you squeeze out toothpaste, you can never get it back in. That's not how it works. Words work the same exact way. There's examples of people who are like, you take a two by four and have kids put nails in it. And then once you rip all those nails out, that two by four can never be the same way. Your words work the same exact way because words matter and words have strength. So make sure you're listening and not speaking out of anger. Now, here's the thing about listening to people's words. A lot of us do not listen to other people. And I'm not saying that as like a call out of like your generation or anything like that. It's the same way for adults. We don't listen, we listen to respond. And so the difference there is like whenever you're sitting and you're talking to me in the atrium and, and I'm just sitting there and I'm nodding and doing this, I'm not listening to get a word in. I'm listening just to hear what it is you have to say. And you guys have probably all been in a conversation like that, right? We're like, you're not hearing what I'm saying. Maybe this has even happened with your parents, right? Uh, just because someone is an authority in your life doesn't mean they're always right. They probably are, but not always. We're like, you're talking about an issue and they just keep responding to something. You're like, that's not what I'm saying. You're not hearing me. That's listening to respond instead of listening to listen. So if we want to be wise about the words that we're hearing, the words that we're saying, whether it's written, whether it's spoken, we need to follow that 2-1 rule. Actually listen and be slow to speak. So uh, each one of these kind of tidbits of wisdom, I have a question for you guys to talk about tonight in your small group. And so the question here is... Um, do you listen to listen or do you listen to respond? Are you someone who's just waiting to see what it is you can say to one-up the conversation, to just make it about you? Or are you someone who actually listens to other people? Now, the next thing we're gonna look at in scripture is called, uh, our choice of words tells us what is in our hearts. Everybody say our hearts. The words that you choose to use according to scripture is a reflection of what is inside of you. Jesus said this in Luke chapter six, verse 45. He says, a man brings good things out of the good that is stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil that is stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, hopefully this is just a harsh reality check for you. If the words that are coming out of you, whether it is in a group text, a Snapchat, in the hallway, at small group, with your parents, you guys get what I'm saying. If those words are not things that are good, that are uplifting, that encourage people, that speak life is kind of the churchy way of saying that, then there's probably something off in your heart. If every time you think about somebody who's in your small group or goes to your school, the only things you can say about them are pretty vile, it's probably not them who has a problem. Jesus is really, really clear in uh, Matthew chapter six and seven in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about judging people. And he says, so often we as his people go around with these giant planks sticking out of our eye while we try to dig out the speck that's in someone else's. And he says, you look ridiculous. And so the reality is if the only words we can use are words that are just jacked up and they aren't encouraging and they aren't good, Jesus says there's something wrong with you. Now, I'm not saying that means you need to like go buy Christian breath mint so that way the words you use are better, right? That's not how this works. It's the reality of whatever is in your heart. And youth group is not here to like make you good or to make you make better choices. That's not the point of Jesus. That's not the point of Crossroads. The point is to be transformed by Jesus. And so if you're someone and the words that you're using, the way that you express yourself is always angry, it's always vile, it's tearing people down, you probably don't have Jesus in your heart. And maybe you're someone who's been around church and you just have always thought, I made this decision, but maybe the reality is you didn't. Or maybe you did and you just kind of shoved Jesus in the corner and left him there and have just had to do it your own way. But Jesus says it's really easy to find out what's in your heart. What are the words that you're using? And so that's the question you guys will have tonight in your small group. What is in your heart? 
Are you someone who brings joy, who brings life? If you know the fruit of the spirit, are those things that are flowing out of you? Or is it something different? Because if it's something different, then you have a choice to make. And you can choose to embrace the reality that Jesus has for you or to keep doing it yourself. Third piece of wisdom from scripture. It's the words you use matter. Now that's something I've already said tonight, so I'm, I'm not shocked there wasn't a gasp after I said that. There you go, makes me feel good. The words you use matter. When I say that, I'm not just saying like the words you use have strength. I'm talking about something a little different. I just couldn't figure out kind of a fun way of saying that in a slide. But essentially I'm talking about the literal words that you use when you express yourself matter. The book of Ephesians, which was written by the Apostle Paul, says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Some scriptures say don't let any foul words Come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that this may benefit all who listen. God's word is really clear. If the words you're using aren't building other people up, keep your mouth shut. And even another layer to this is that aspect of using unwholesome talk or foul language, as scripture says. Um, I remember when I got adopted at 12, I kind of grown up in foster care. I said and did whatever I wanted to. And then, like, I got these ultra-conservative, like, homeschool adoptive parents. Like, we all wore denim. We couldn't go out. We only went to church. It was weird. Um, But, like, in their house, because of this verse, I couldn't use what they called Christian cuss words because I meant the same thing. I was doing something that was foul. So if I stubbed my toe and I yelled, shoot, then I got grounded for cussing. Or if I said, oh, my gosh, then I got grounded for using the Lord's name in vain. They, like, took this verse to mean exactly what it says. And I used to make fun of them, but the reality is they're right. Scripture's saying that whatever's inside of me is what's coming out in those moments. And there are ways that we can express our anger, that we can express disappointment, that we can give people feedback that builds them up instead of attacks who they are. Like it's one thing, we have like a group of you who've come and helped plan some stuff out. We call it like a student council group. And I said, hey, you guys can give feedback. It's one thing to walk in and say like, hey, I hate it here. The atrium sucks and I don't wanna be here anymore. That is not helpful. That is not kind. It's another thing to say like, hey, I really miss having nine square in there and it gave me something to do. Now guess what's in the atrium? nine square and you guys have a blast playing it the last two weeks. It's stuff like that. You can give feedback. You can take someone who's doing something wrong and encourage them in a way that is wholesome and that is kind. And that's what I mean when I say the words you use matter. There's going to be times where people hurt you and you want to lash out back at them. The words you use in that moment matter. There's going to be times where you're just hurt and you need to get something off your chest. And scripture says the words that you use in that moment matter because they reflect what is inside of you. Whenever um, I get really worked up and pent up, and this is probably not something that I should share from stage, but welcome to youth group. I don't lie to you. You don't get to lie to me. There's times I really want to use a four-letter word to describe a situation. Yeah, I know. Gasp. There you go. The words that I use when I'm home just talking to my wife and I'm describing something that really hurts or sucks matters. The words that I choose to use to express myself, even when it's not going to get to someone else, matters because it reflects what's inside of my heart. So uh, as this kind of last segment, the last question I have for you here is if the words you used whenever you were in a text message or you were alone with somebody, if the words, the true words that you feel in that you say, if those were written on your forehead, would you be ashamed of it? If the words that I use whenever I'm in that type of situation, like I was just saying, if that was written across my head when I got to church, I would probably be ashamed. I would probably go to the cross and say, I need some more transformation. The words that we use matters. And then last but not least, when it comes to our words, this one's kind of long, but be gracious, ask forgiveness fast, and remember that we're all people. I don't expect you guys to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I don't try to act like I am, someone is going to use words with you that hurt you. 
in those situations, be gracious. We have all been there where we've let something slip out of anger and immediately said, I should not have said that. We have all been in a situation where we vented in an unhealthy way and that's gotten back to somebody where it's like, that's not what I meant. So whenever you're on the other end of that, choose grace. And then whenever you are the person who's done the hurting, make sure you go and you ask for forgiveness fast. Forgiveness, whenever it comes when you've been caught, is totally different than the forgiveness that comes whenever you've not been caught yet. One of those feels genuine and one feels forced, right? Like when your mom says, apologize to your sibling because you hit them, whatever that thing may be, and you give the force, I'm sorry. It's disingenuous. Yeah, you're like, I'm sorry. It's disingenuous, right? It doesn't really matter. Whenever you know you've messed up, go and be a man. And I'm not being a sexist when I say that. It's just an expression. Go be a man and ask for forgiveness. Go be the person that you're claiming to be and ask for that forgiveness. And as we go through this process, remember, we're all just people. No one here is perfect. No one at Crossroads is perfect. No one in your small group is perfect. We are all people and we're gonna have these slips up, slip ups and we can choose to be gracious or we can choose to not. I hope you'll choose gracious. The last thing when it comes to forgiveness, um, this is just kind of good general life advice from Jesus. Um, the disciples fought each other literally all the time. They were constantly in arguments. They were, there was times where they were cutting people's ears off, where they were asking for God to send down fire and kill a bunch of people. And Jesus had to say like, hey, knock it off. And this is how he told them to handle conflict. This comes from Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen, you've won them over. When someone hurts you, should you run to someone else to talk about it first? No. Should you start a group chat without that person in it and talk about it with all your friends to make sure they think that person's wrong too? No. Jesus says whenever we have conflict, whenever we've hurt each other, we should go to the other person first. Now this verse, this passage continues, and he says if that other person won't acknowledge it, they won't say they did something wrong, then you go to someone else and bring them with you to go and talk to that person. He gives this whole layout for it, and we're actually going to spend some time talking about this in a later series, but I felt like this really mattered, especially when we're talking about the power of our words. It doesn't say when someone's hurt you, use your words to blast them online. It doesn't say use your words to go behind their back and stab them deeper than they stabbed you. The reality is Jesus says if we're going to be his followers, his commandment is to go to that person directly and ask for forgiveness. Now, uh, as the wrap-up question for this section, I just want to say, like, who's someone you need to forgive? Or who's someone who you need to ask forgiveness from? Now, our last thought is just like your words online or in person, they have incredible strength. We've talked about that throughout the whole night, and I hope that's something that sinks in with you, and I hope that it's something that you desire to change. Now, if you listened tonight, you'll know if you want to change the words you use, it's not about you doing something. You have to spend time with Jesus and be transformed. That's the only way that the reality of the words you use is going to change. Now, we thought we would end our time together just through singing a song, having a moment of reflection. It's a song that you guys probably all know. It's called So Will I. We've sang it several times before. Um, the thing I love about this song is how it sets up um, the reality of existence itself. It says, like, if creation sings your praises, then so will I. If everything in creation goes where you send it, then so will I. Um, the reality is when God designed you, he designed you for praise. Um, in the book of James, it talks, we said this earlier in this series, that salt water and fresh water can't flow from the same source. Something that speaks life, fresh water, something that speaks death, salt water, can't come from the same source person. The reality is that when Jesus designed you, he designed you for praise. He designed you to be his ambassador. He designed you to be his hands and feet on earth. As we sing this song, I want you to ask yourself, are you going to be what God designed you for? Or are you going to be something different? When God says go, are you going to go? Or are you just going to sit there? 
The reality of tonight, the reality of this whole series isn't just about not being on your phone so much. The reality is that you were designed for so much more than the lie the world gives us. The reality of tonight is not, I want you to be nice. It's that God designed your words to have impact and purpose. Whether you are 16 or you are 30, your words have impact and purpose. Your life has impact and purpose. Are you going to choose to waste it? Are you going to choose to tell the God of the universe, I will go wherever you send me. I will use my words however you designed and I will be your ambassador here on earth. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the gift of your son. Jesus, I pray over this time as we sing this song to you that this is just a moment for somebody to say, Jesus, I recognize you designed all of us for a purpose. And if the world will function the way you said, then so will I. Jesus, be here and spirit moves. In your son's name we pray, amen.